I'm David Scott from the Green Acres Branch Library, and I'm participating in the virtual readout for BAN Books Week. I'm reading an excerpt from The Glass Castle by Jeanette Walls. It's a personal memoir of hers, uh, her childhood growing up, and it's been challenged um, for reasons of profanity, sexual content, religious viewpoint, and drunkenness. I'm reading an excerpt starting at page 193. That afternoon, I was alone in the house, still enjoying the itchy, dry feeling of my chlorine-scoured skin and the wobbly bone feeling you get from a lot of exercise, when I heard a knock on the door. The noise startled me. Almost no one ever visited us at 93 Little Hobart Street. I opened the door a few inches and peered out. A balding man carrying a file folder under his arm stood on the porch. Something about him said, government, a species dad had trained us to avoid. Is the head of the household in? he asked. Who wants to know, I said. The man smiled the way you do to sugarcoat bad news. I'm with child welfare, and I'm looking for either Rex or Rosemary Walls, he said. They're not here, I said. How old are you, he asked. Twelve. Can I come in? I could see he was trying to peer behind me into the house. I pulled the door all the way closed, except for a crack. Mum and Dad wouldn't want me to let you in, I said. Until they talk to their attorney, I added to impress him. Just tell me what it is you're after, and I'll pass on the message. The man said that someone whose name he was not at liberty to disclose had called his office, recommending an inquiry into conditions at 93 Little Hobart Street, where it was possible that dependent children might be living in a state of neglect. No one's neglecting us, I said. You sure? I'm sure, mister. Dad work? Of course, I said. He does odd jobs, and he's an entrepreneur. He's devel developing a technology to burn low-grade bitumous coal safely and efficiently. And your mother? She's an artist, I said, and a writer, and a teacher. Really, the man said, and made a note on a pad. Where? I don't think Mom and Dad want me talking with you without them here, I said. Come back when they're here. They'll answer your questions. Good, the man said. I will come back. Tell them that. He passed a business card through the crack in the doorway. I watched him make his way down to the ground. Careful on those stairs now, I called. We're in the process of building a new set. After the man left, I was so furious that I ran up the hillside and started hurling rocks, big rocks that took two hands to lift, into the garbage pit. Except for Irma, I never hated anyone more than I hated that child welfare man. Not even Ernie Goad. At least when Ernie and his gang came around yelling that we were trash, we could fight them off with rocks. But if the child welfare man got it, got it into his head that we were an unfit family, we'd have no way to drive him off. He launched an investigation and ended up sending me and Brian and Laurie and Maureen off to live with different families, even though we all got good grades and knew Morse code. I couldn't let that happen. No way was I going to let to lose Brian and Laurie and Maureen. I wish we could do the skedaddle. For a long time, Brian, Laurie, and I had assumed we would leave Welch sooner or later. Every couple of months, we'd ask Dad if we were going to move on. He'd sometimes talk about Australia or Alaska, but he never took any action. And when we asked Mom, she'd start singing some song about her get up and go had got up and went. Maybe coming back to Welch had killed the idea Dad used to have of himself as a man going places. The truth was, we were stuck. When Mom got home, I gave her the man's card and told her about his visit. I was still in a lather. I said that since neither she nor Dad could be bothered to work, and since she refused to leave Dad, the government was going to do the job of splitting up the family for her. I expected Mom to come back with one of her choice remarks, but she listened to my tirade in silence. Then she said she needed to consider her options. She sat down at her easel. She had run out of canvases and had begun to paint on plywood. So she picked up a piece of wood, got out her palette, squeezed some paints onto it, and selected a brush. What are you doing, I asked. I'm thinking, she said. Mom worked quickly, automatically, as if she knew exactly what it was she wanted to, wanted to paint. A figure took shape in the middle of the board. It was a woman from the waist up, with her arms raised. Blue concentric circles appeared around the waist. The blue was water. Mum was painting a picture of a woman drowning in a stormy lake. 
When she was finished, she sat for a long time in silence, staring at the picture. So what are we going to do? I finally asked. Jeanette, you're so focused it's scary. You didn't answer my question, I said. I'll get a job, Jeanette, she snapped. She threw her paintbrush into the jar that held her turpentine and sat there looking at the drowning woman. That's an excerpt from The Glass Castle by Jeanette Walls. Read it today.